I'm Howard Chansky. I'm the chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. I want to welcome everybody to our uh, April 2024 Grand Rounds. And this morning, we're going to discuss a topic that's uh, been a subject of much internal discussion within uh, the spine team and department leadership about what role we want this to have uh, in our spine program. And uh, presenting this this morning will be Dr. Eli Bunzel, one of our R4 residents who is going into spine surgery. And then also Dr. Viral Patel, a clinical assistant professor uh, who is a spine surgeon in our department. And their talk is uh, titled The Inside Scope on Endoscopic Spine Surgery. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chansky, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Eli Bunzel. I'm one of the uh, fourth year residents here at the University of Washington. Uh, thanks for being here this morning and, um, and allowing Dr. Patel and I to, to speak on endoscopic spine surgery. It seems to be a, uh, a growing field um, and an exciting one in the field of spine surgery. And um, we're going to kind of go through the basics here. And I'm going to start with a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, first and foremost, I have no disclosures. So general outline of this talk, um, again, I'll give a, a brief history the end. Uh, of endoscopic spine surgery. I'll talk about techniques and approaches um, kind of throughout uh, my presentation, and I'll, I'll um, include evidence as well. Then I'll go through the generations of endoscopic spine surgery, and you'll come to know what that means uh, by the end. I'll give a, a sort of update of where we are now and current challenges that, uh, that we face in terms of implementation. So the origins of endoscopic spine surgery date back to the early and mid-1970s and were spearheaded by Drs. Cambin and P.G. Kata, who were both orthopedic surgeons. These procedures came about uh, in an interest to minimize surgical dissection of the paraspinal musculature, to decrease postoperative pain, and to prevent potential complications such as stiffness, instability, and weakness that can occur with when traditional open posterior surgery uh, is performed for decompression. These original procedures were done percutaneously and were designed only really for microdiscectomies uh, in which patients presented with discernible unilateral radiculopathy with imaging and clinical exam findings that correlated to a specific level. These were performed posterolaterally using a transforaminal approach for far lateral and foraminal disc herniations. So Dr. Parvis Cambin uh, at the University of Pennsylvania was the first to publish on a small series of patients undergoing the so-called percutaneous decompression in 1983. This was a series of nine patients over a 10-year period with clinical and myelographic evidence of disc herniations, mostly at L3-4 and L4-5. Now, keep in mind that this was pre-MRI, so CT myelogram was the standard diagnostic imaging modality for spine pathology at that time. The procedure was performed uh, under local anesthesia and with the patient in the prone position. He used an 18-gauge needle, and he started about 8 to 9 centimeters lateral to the midline aiming at a 35 degree angle towards the spinal column, bypassing the transverse process and docking in the foramen using fluoro to confirm positioning. He replaced the needle with a K wire <clears throat> and using fluoroscopy confirmed the location once more. He then placed a trocar over the wire and then a 4.9 millimeter sheet over the trocar to gain access to the foramen and the pathology. Using a combination of suction, cutters, and forceps, he was able to remove the herniation after successfully windowing the annulus fibrosis. The patients reported complete relief of their symptoms. Those with neurologic deficits had both subjective and objective improvements uh, in their symptoms. And after eight months, no patients reported recurrence of radicular symptoms. So these were some of the original figures from his paper, and you could see the demonstration of the intraoperative setup in the top left with the patient in the prone position, see arm available for confirmation. And then in the top right, you could see the various instruments utilized uh, in this procedure. You could see these fluoro images from the, uh, from the original procedure that he performed, and I thought these were really interesting, uh, particularly E and F uh, in figure three. You can see the, the cannula that's inserted uh, into that disc space and then the working forceps uh, taking out the pathology. So Camden reported just three years later on a series of 50 consecutive patients undergoing the same procedure. And he found that 88% of those patients had either excellent or good results 
according to the modified McNabb criteria for lumbar microdiscectomy uh, and clinical outcomes. Their mean length of hospital stay was 2.3 days in this study, uh, and there were no significant complications encountered, including neurologic deficits, wound issues, or disc space, disc space infections. So just a few years later, uh, Dr. Hijikata in Tokyo published uh, 12 years worth of experience starting in 1975, performing a similar procedure that he coined a, quote, nucleotomy to decompress nerve root impingement. He used what he called a needle, but was really a kind of a punching device to create a fenestration in the annulus fibrosis, and he extracted the herniated nucleus pulposus percutaneously. In his experience, 72% of patients reported excellent or good results uh, and relief of their symptoms. Now, in 1983, doctors Hausman and Forst, who were two German spine surgeons, introduced what they called a nucleoscope uh, that was used during open discectomy to ensure that the loose intradiscal fragments had been sufficiently extracted. This was sort of an early endoscope uh, and provided more direct visualization uh, for the surgeons and was the first time someone had introduced a camera in a spine procedure and published on the technique. Just three years later in 1986, um, Dr. Schreiber and Suiza, who are two Swiss surgeons, described their technique for arthroscopic nucleotomy in a series of 40 patients and reported success. This added to an ever-growing trend of using endoscopy to visualize deep structures within the spine and confirm adequate, adequate decompression. So they eventually <clears throat> published their results uh, of a larger series of 109 patients undergoing this percutaneous nucleotomy under direct visualization using a camera to confirm the decompression. They would perform a percutaneous decompression and using an ipsilateral 7.2 millimeter diameter cannula through which they placed an endoscope, they were able to directly visualize the decompression uh, and confirm the uh, successful procedure. Interestingly, they used a 70 degree scope to visualize the herniation in this particular series. They reported 61% successful su success rate uh, with patients reporting excellent or good results. However, 27.5% of their patients reported poor results, and this most commonly resulted from inadequate decompression. In that paper, they also noted that 29 of the 109 patients required conversion to open uh, due to issues with direct visualization or uh, intraoperative changes due to inconsistency with preoperative imaging. So the approach to disc herniations I've described thus far have been posterolateral, uh, but to be clear, this is, this is a transforaminal approach to the lumbar spine and is accessed through the lateral paraspinal musculature without disrupting the posterior ligaments and staying away from the facet joints. This technique util was utilized worldwide and was the standard approach in the early years of percutaneous and eventually endoscopic surgery as demonstrated here. So by the late 80s and early 90s, word was traveling worldwide about the feasibility and benefits of percutaneous and endoscopic spinal decompression. After several published case series in recognition of his pioneering work, in 1991, Dr. Kamen introduced an anatomic triangle, which he coined conveniently Kamen's triangle, defined as a right triangle over the dorsolateral disc for reliable access to the most common herniations being addressed percutaneously. The hypotenuse of the of the triangle was the exiting nerve root. The base uh, was the superior border of the caudal vertebra, and the height was the dura traversing and the traversing nerve root. This was that really sort of born about from endoscopic spine surgery, but it's actually been the anatomic blueprints, not just for docking the cannula and transforaminal spine surgery, but also for transforaminal steroid injections uh, for treatment of disc herniations and still applies to the modern day. So up till now, um, everything had been uh, done percutaneously and, uh, and with sort of rudimentary systems, but modernization and consolidation of endoscopic spine surgery really took off when Dr. Anthony Young uh, introduced the first uniportal full endoscopic spine system in 1999. Just to be clear, a full endoscopic procedure is performed through a single portal through which passes the light source, irrigation with suction outflow, and working channel through which surgical instruments may be passed and exchanged. This is still utilized in current applications of endoscopic spine surgery uh, and was really sort of the, uh, the birth of modern day uh, applications. So 
So this video illustrates a uniportal, full transferaminal endoscopic spine approach to the L45 disc space. You can see based on the fluoro shot in the top right that this is the left side. So the left side of the screen is cranial and the right side is caudal. The annulus fibrosis is in the six o'clock position, which he's pointing to there. And the posterior longitudinal ligament is closer to the 12 o'clock position. The yellow material at nine o'clock is epidural fat. You can see the surgeon is using a small electric cautery device to stop bleeding <clears throat> from vessels in the working view. And then in just a few seconds, as the surgeon rotates the camera to the left, you can see the superior facet at 12 o'clock and at four o'clock, you can see the superior portion of the pedicle with the disc in between those two. Now you can see the surgeon <clears throat> rotates the scope cranially to visualize fat within the cranial aspect of the neural foramen. This is because most far lateral or foraminal disc herniations push the exiting nerve root cranially and dorsally within the foramen. So the cannula is aimed in that direction. And I just wanted to end it here to show you, this is kind of what a intraoperative setup looks like for a unilateral full endoscopic spine procedure. So everything up until now encompasses what's known as the first generation of endoscopic spine surgery. This was largely defined by percutaneous transferaminal endoscopic surgery and was capped by the introduction of the young endoscopic spine system, which I showed just a few slides ago. This ushered in what would be known as full uniportal spine endoscopy. Now it's important to reiterate that the indications and pathologies that were addressed with these procedures were typically far lateral and foraminal herniations, most commonly at L3-4 and L4-5. Now, if the first generation was defined by the transferaminal approach to the spine, then the second generation can be defined by the introduction of bipolar endoscopy along with the interlaminar approach. Both of these innovations came, out, uh, came about and came to market really to address shortcomings in the first generation. So the interlaminar approach quickly gained popularity as it addressed two major issues within transferaminal endoscopy. First, it allowed access for decompression of more paracentral and interlaminar disc herniations that were otherwise quite difficult to access with a transferaminal approach. And second, it allowed the surgeon to access pathology at the L5-S1 disc space, which was an anatomic challenge using the lateral approach, as the iliac crest often presents direct access to the L5-S1 foramen. Now, published in 1996, this article by DeAnthony et al. illustrated a few trans or a new translaminar or interlaminar endoscopic technique indicated for more paracentral or interferaminal herniations. It introduced not only this new approach to discogenic pathology, but it also introduced the concept of two working portals for endoscopy, which was revolutionary. For this approach, a 30, a 30 degree scope was utilized and reported to be successful. And this is now a little bit more common. This technique paper didn't focus as much on patient outcomes, unfortunately, but it did describe the technique and associated advantages of interlaminar access. Here you can see the general setup of this operative technique, including surgeon positioning, patient positioning, and the working zone for interlaminar endoscopy. In the bottom right, you can see an example of the uh, endoscopy view, including the dura, which is retracted centrally with the disc space in front of it. This approach and technique provided several advantages. It allowed the surgeon to explore and remove pathology from within the epidural space safely, and it provided access, like I mentioned before, to the L5-S1 level. It also allowed a bilateral decompression, which you can see in this top right uh, image here. So it allowed access to, um, to more pathology and increased um, indications. So this is another video example, this time uh, of interlaminar endoscopy. You can't see based on the fluoro, but we're on the right side of the patient. So right is cranial and left is caudal. We're looking directly at the superficial uh, ligamentum flavum here uh, in the center of the screen. At 12 o'clock, you can see the spinous process with overlying muscle. And at six o'clock is the lamina and fibers of the facet joint. In order to get through the lamina, a burr or series of kerosene and rongeurs are used to gain good exposure. As you can see, he's removing the superficial ligament first and then the ligamentum flavum as he takes out the deepest layer overlying the epidural fat from the traversing nerve root.
Now, there's a large space between these two layers and is oftentimes described as <clears throat> what they call the black hole, which indicates that you're at the correct depth, which you can see he just gained access to there. Once you identify the traversing nerve root underneath this black hole, well, first of all, you'll, you'll identify epidural sac, and then you'll identify the traversing nerve root. And once you do, you can retract it centrally and gain direct access to a herniated disc. As you can imagine, bipedal endoscopy through an interlaminar window provides a familiar surgical view and positioning for the surgeon who's trained more classically with posterior approaches. The use of two portals with working instruments creates increased surgeon dexterity and gives enhanced visualization of the surgical field. It's also been shown to improve decompression capabilities and take less operative time compared to uniportal surgery. In the bottom image, you can see the advantages of endoscopic visualization versus minimally invasive tubular surgery, including a cleaner field, more space for mobilization and isolation of nerve roots and dura, and a deeper field of vision as well. Finally, biportal endoscopy serves to expand the indications as surgeons can be more successful to decompress bilateral stenosis and, uh, and more, more sort of comprehensive decompression. So with the advent of bicordial and interlaminar endoscopy, the indications for endoscopic surgery began to increase to include laminotomies and decompressions for stenosis. In this retrospective Paramash case control study from 2022, patients receiving either uniportal or bipodal endoscopy were compared. The authors looked at VAS, ODI, and McNabb criteria for clinical outcomes in addition to other surgical details. They found that surgical duration was significantly shorter in the bipodal group and surgeons reported increased ease and feasibility of decompression with bipodal techniques. Now, other than that, other measures, including VAS, ODI scores, hospital stay, and time to ambulation were not significantly different in this series. A high percentage of patients reported excellent and good outcomes in both groups, as you can see. So this brings us to the third generation, <clears throat> defined largely by endoscopic spinal decompression beyond just microdiscectomies, and entering into foraminotomies, laminotomies, laminectomies, uh, and um, bilateral decompressions. Now, recent evidence continues to suggest that while uniportal and biportal endoscopy is sufficient to perform these procedures, the biportal technique is becoming much more widely accepted and facile uh, within the orthopedic world. So what about the fourth and final generation? Well, I'd argue that we're now kind of in the latter half of the third generation. Uh, and entering slowly uh, but surely into the new generation of instrumentation and fusion surgeries. Now, the vast majority of endoscopic procedures being performed now are for microdiscectomies and decompressive laminotomies or laminectomies for stenosis, secondary to either facet disease, hypertrophic ligamentum flavum, disc herniations, or some combination therein. So there's much research to be done and follow-up to be done before the implementation of fusion techniques um, and before those become mainstream. But I would say it's, it's safe to say there's plenty of interest uh, in that burgeoning field. This is a graph from a review article out of uh, MGH published in the Spine Journal in 2022, and really just highlights the near exponential increase in research surrounding this very topic. There's a clear push to better understand implications, indications, and applications um, of this technology in modern day practice. So where are we now compared to the rest of the world? Well, this bell curve is a generalization of the technology adoption lifestyle, <clears throat> sorry, life cycle. Um, and as things stand right now, we're still lagging behind the rest of the world. Uh, the highest utilization and growth in endoscopic spine is still within Asian and European markets, uh, which has been borne out by data. In fact, a recent global survey showed 96.7% of Asian surgeons indicate that they perform moderate, minimally invasive and endoscopic spine surgery compared to just 81.6% of non-Asian surgeons. And those are mostly Europeans as well. Um, Asia still represents the largest market for endoscopic spine surgery uh, with Europe following shortly thereafter. But I would say we are largely still in sort of the early market phase, um, but there's a lot of barriers to adoption. And I would say, you know, there are a few reasons for the lag here in the United States. Um, firstly, there's a lack of adequate billing codes in the United States for endoscopic spine surgery, which certainly de-incentivizes surgeons from bringing this into their practice. Because of the lack of billing codes and because of, um, um, and because of 
you know, a few other reasons, there's comparably poorer reimbursement for endoscopic procedures. Because endoscopy has thus far not included implantable technologies like cages or screws, um, major device companies are not really incentivized to get into the market, particularly if it relies on tools that most hospital systems already have. Now, that said, Orthrex has recently begun selling products for endoscopy, but similarly large companies are still lagging. There's also a lack of available training sites to increase the pipeline of surgeons across the country as well. But this does seem to be growing uh, as the years pass. And finally, there's a steep learning curve for those who wish to bring this technique into their practice, particularly if they're mid-career. Um, and the learning curve is, is uh, quite difficult to overcome, uh, which Dr. Patel will get into. And those are my slides. Thanks, everyone. Right, so I have no disclosure, and so I can just briefly talk about the uh, learning curve some basic techniques for the bipodal endoscopic spine surgery, uh, some complications and the uh, procedure related complications, and uh, some comparison between the endoscopic and the minimum invasive uh, spine surgery, and, uh, and then uh, what is uh, what going to be the future uh, moving ahead. So any new procedure we do is we're going to have some uh, running curves and growing pins. Um, so I think we start with the, the first thing they started with the lumbar discectomy. So what's a, it's a learning curve for the full endoscopic lumbar discectomy is, so if you are a pretty naive surgeon and never did the endoscopy surgery before, and that once you start doing it, it takes time to become efficient and proficient about doing the surgery. So this is a study, uh, they reviewed the single surgeon performed the endoscopic discectomy. And he, the surgeon also performed the open micro discectomy. They took like 57 and 66 patients uh, from 2006 to 2009 to compare between and see how much operative time was uh, taken by the surgeon. The endoscopic discectomy, he pretty much took the double the time than his open micro discectomies. And initial period of time, the he had a little bit more complication rates. The patient had some transient uh, numbness, which resolved within a, within a week. Uh, had a, some inefficient disc removal, uh, and had a two nerve injuries, and uh, six reoperation required within a six weeks. So, which is kind of thirteen percent. But this is like a, or he's when he did the fifty seven cases, the, all the complication happens, and within the f first half of his fifty seven cases, and once he passed that. Period is that complication rate is pretty, pretty much same as an open discectomy and patient outcome is pretty compared. So they also now now we started doing the lumbar decompression, which is bipodal endoscopic spine surgery, and you did lumbar decompression laminectomies and in the bilateral decompression. So if you're a pretty naive surgeon for endoscopy surgery, and but you're trained in the open and micro, microscopic decompression of minimal invasive. They did the, the one surgeon did the surgery that he took plus 60 patients. Uh, he did the bilateral endoscopic spine surgery decompression from 2017 to 2018. And they are looking at the operative time taken by the surgeon. They consider uh, a failure if surgeon takes more than 75 minutes uh, for this purpose of the study. And uh, they divide two halves. One is 30, first 30 cases. And then the one is the 30 cases later. So basically, they divided the 60 cases in the first half and second half. The first half, he took 105 minutes average, while the second half of the period, he took 62 minutes. He became efficient uh, during the surgery. He had a 28 minutes, means he took more than 75 minutes in the entire um, in the study, while 22 failures happened in the first 30 
30 cases, while it's only six cases, six failures happened in the last 30 cases. So an overall complication rate was 10%, but most of the complication happened in the initial half. So they have a learning curve cumulative summation test, uh, which a, is according to the operative time. And they find out the, according to the test, the surgeon they become competent enough to do the surgery on a 50th operation. So when you are an IU surgeon, it takes time to run these procedures. So now, so that brings us to like, if you, if you're doing the endoscopy surgery and, and then you're performing the lumbar de decompressions with endoscopy, and now you're trying to do something different. Uh, like now people started doing the endoscopy post to cervical for aminotomies. So if they, they did the study is a, a learning curve for the new procedure, but you're doing the end, endoscopic surgeries before. So you're already experienced with the endoscopic surgery for one year, and now you're trying to perform a different kind of procedure through the endoscope. For that is the mean operative time was 71 minutes. And they did the surgery with single surgeon, 50 patients. He did the bi bi bicoronal endoscopy posterior cervical parameter from 2018 to 2021. And they consider, for the purpose of this study, they consider the failure is if you take more than 78 minutes um, per surgery. So they divide the 50 cases in the first 20 cases and, and after 20 cases, so last 30 cases. So you become more, more confident at the, at the 20th operation. So if you're already trained with the endoscopy, doing the other procedure through the endoscopy, it takes less surgery to become competent. So that brings us to, if you are uh, doing a minimal invasive surgery and then now you can start doing the percutaneous endoscopy surgeries, what is the, how is the learning curve? So there was a study where it was done um, um, where the two surgeons, one surgeon is uh, like 10 years experience with spine surgery, but pretty, pretty, no, pretty much no experience with the minimal invasive surgery. And he started doing the percutaneous endoscopy a lumbar disjectable and compared to the group B surgeon who he did, he also had a 10 years of experience, but he was doing last two years, he was doing the demonstration and teaching of their uh, percutaneous endoscopic lumbar disjectomies. So they, they divide, they have a certain number of the patients in between the two groups and uh, pretty much 60 patients, either, either group, the group A surgeon, which has less experience in the endoscopy, he took almost double the time for operative time. It also has a more intraoperative bleeding and then the postoperative hospital stay for the patients. He, the surgeon who, who had uh, never did the endoscopy on minimum invasive before had a little bit of higher complication rate for initial 20 cases. But as he, as he becomes more and more experienced, his complication rate went, went down. The most common complication for this, uh, this surgery for either surgeon was um, 16 patients with the inadequate decompression and discectomy out of nine, never, never, never relieve any symptoms postoperatively. So there are like almost a 13 percent patient with inadequate decompressions. So I think I, I reviewed the literatures and most of the time, like since 1970 to now, everyone has, a, who is starting as a new surgeon doing endoscopy, the new inadequate decompression is pretty real complication means they they sometimes you couldn't figure out how much to decompress and how far you have to go with them laterally to do the laminectomy, medial facetectomy to complete decompression. And also it becomes harder for them to decide how much discectomy uh, they had to do for the, for the, you know, for the herniated disc. So, so now like these are the, some basic techniques they can try to avoid uh, some of the common mistake you can you can do for the initial when you start start as a new endoscopic surgeon. So I'm going to talk about the, some of the basic techniques of the bilateral endoscopic spine surgery. So portal position is in, utmost important. So you have to have a perfect actually, no 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 tilting of the CM has a, like the patient has a perfect pedicle you can see and as far as processes. So you can see that when you are throwing the ipsilateral posterior axis between the interlaminar decompression, and then we have an endoscopic portal and then we are working portal. So you can see there is a, there is a two portals here that on the left side, you are looking at the knot of the disc, you're looking at the lamina of the superior and inferior 
So basically, interlaminar space and then the, the lamina that superior and inferior. So that's your portal. If you're doing the transforaminal approach to the bipolar endoscopy, you're looking at the pedicle center at the four and five. In this case, if you're doing the four five transforaminal and you're doing the lateral border of the pedicle, your portal has to be at least a two to three centimeter apart from the lateral border of the pedicle. For, for transforaminal approach for alpha S1, you always going to have ILEC clusp and then sacral ally in your brain. So those portals are. For transforaminal, you can put a little bit closer to the pedicle, uh, mm -hmm. so that becomes the access a little bit harder. So the portal position is that most important in order to in order to uh, be a success. Also, the position of the portal is also important. Uh, how deep you are. If you're too superficial, then you're always going to see the muscle creeping into your view, and it becomes harder. This is in this case, like you can see the muscles everywhere. And in this portal, if you're too superficial, you can see muscles every time. And then the, you are aiming for enough. Just a second, I'm gonna go for the previous slide. The, this is what you're aiming for. Um, you're aiming for the seeing the ligament of plum. You're aiming to see the superior and inferior uh, lamina in the in the lamina space in the portal. And this is an, an intes, interspinous ligament. And then the, you are looking at the medial edge of the facet joint here. So that's what you're looking for. Yeah. So I think too superficial is also, is you're seeing the muscle all the time, but if you're too deep and then you're doing the transpyramidal, you can easily go into the psoas muscle, be it the psoas hematoma, and you are running the fluid through it. So you can actually get the hydroperitoneum. And in some cases, they also mention about the hydrothorax after the surgery. So now we are going into the once your portals are portals are the important uh, set up and then the, you're you're deep enough and where you are. So this is where we are like in the joints, we have a joints inside, so where we are. Here on the spine, we don't have a joint. We are basically on a paraspinal region on top of the lamina. So they can say it's base camp. So this is what you you're supposed to see when you're doing your lumbar decompressions. Uh, microdiscectomy, bilateral lumbar decompression, or unilateral lumbar decompression. So this is what you're supposed to see. This is, you're seeing the, um, just a second, I can go back in this slide, sorry. So you're seeing the dorsal part of the uh, surface of the upper lamina, the medial surface of the upper lamina. You're seeing the facet joint medial side. You're seeing the proximal margin of the lower lamina, and you are seeing the distal and proximal spinous facet. So they recognize this is a this is a post boomerang means the lower edge of the superior lamina going into your inferior articular process. So that's your post boomerang. That's what you're supposed to see. And this is your base camp where your reviewing portal is, and this is how it's gonna work through the working portal. So orientation of the uh um your endoscope is also important. So this is how you, you need to see. You need to see the interspinous uh, ligament. You need to see the, the muscle bundle on top of the facet capsule. You can need to see the lamina, uh, superior lamina, and inferior lamina. And this is what, how you, you need to see. Uh, that, that I think you can see that oral like working for endoscope. You can see a little bit on the tilted on the 10 degree. So that's what you. That's what your orientation is. So rotational orientation is that most important. If you keep it neutral, then your vertical air, lamina is going to be too vertical. And this is if you keep a little bit of a ten degrees of tilt on the endoscope, and this is how you're going to see. And then it becomes easier to work through the working portal. Your orientation becomes more important. So now it's also important in your base game when you are in the base game, the vascular and the uh, geometry is also important because sometimes you keep bleeding and then you're the working with your viewing portal and just the portal, you only see the red screen. Sorry, um, um, only see the red screen. So it's important to see where your where your bleeders are, so you can actually uh, quarterize the bleeder and you can have a clear views. And when you are doing a decompression, so these are the, the boomerangs that we are talking about. So if the first boomerang is your your excision of the superior spinous process, 
impair part of the superior lamina and then the medial part of the impair article process of the superior, superior lamina. The second boomerang is your rate that you go underneath the spirus, uh, superior spirus process and then you, you excise the lower part of the lamina of the contralateral side on the superior side. And also you excise the impure article process medial side on the contralateral side. The third boomerang is you start the ipsilateral uh, impure laminectomy, subspinous process excision, and then that, that boomerang extend to the lamina to the other side. And then you create this space wider to do the interlaminar decompression as and you know, unilateral and the bilateral side. So now that brings us to how much space you need uh, in order to get into the contralateral side. So, so your your endoscopy portal is eight millimeters, and in most of the instrumentation you're working through the uh, through the working working portal is five millimeter in in width. So you will need at least a 15 millimeter midline space in order to go across the other side and uh, and then do the adequate decompression contralateral. You know, also, it's also important due to this aligned water pressure, the side of the dura is usually compressed while you're doing the um, endoscopic surgeries. So it becomes important to understand the uh, most of the time at the alpha fine, alpha ash one, uh, if you look at just a second, if you're looking at the ligamentum flavum, you can have a ligamentum flavum has attachment of the center fibrous band, so keep the dura up. So if you're going to the other side, that makes your, uh, you can you can have incident durotomy there if you're trying to go across and then decompress the other side. So that's important things to remember. So these are the common mistakes. So when you're going through the working portal, you have a rich thing bleeding, so you have to understand your vascular geometry is very corporized. So then your field becomes clear to do the surgery. Rotational disorientation is a real thing. Uh, inadequate decompression is a real thing because you uh, sometimes you're rotational disoriented and then the, you're not able to take out the adequate lamina and media pastectomies. So that's a real thing for the naive endoscopic surgeon. Too much resection is also a real thing. Sometimes you're you all excise lamina too much, and then you excise the superior articular process, and you ended up having antrogenic instability that needs to be converted into the fusion. That was also reported in the literature when you're an IV endoscopic surgeon. The fracture of the lamina is important, and continuous liberating and decreased the epidural hematoma is a pretty common complication. Incident gerotomy, as I discussed, you know, always remember when you're trying to do the contralit decompression. Incident and there is a fibrous band that keeps the uh, dura up on the media at the right in the center. Um, so that that's uh, can be avoided if you are very careful about it. Hydroperitoneum psoas hematoma and retroperitoneal hematoma is pretty, it's a really non complication for naive endoscopic surgeons because their their working portal is too deep when they are doing the transpyramidal, they're little to the uh, lamina and in between the transit process and they easily get into the so as muscle and can we go can go deeper. So this brings us uh, this is a this is a paper that was uh, published in Arizona about the complications of the transpyramidal endoscopic decompression surgery for the lumbar pyramidal decompression stenosis and later stenosis. That's they basically this is the retrospective study. They included that 1839 patients from 2006 to 2015. They, they included the patient just with the unilateral lumbar radiculopathy from the pyramidal lateral stenosis, either it's from the dust bulge or bony stenosis or disc herniation. All patient was underwent the transpyramidal endoscopic decompression, and then they divide the um, all the uh, outcome according to the MACNAP criteria, and then the, the complication they divided into the five grades with this uh, according to the severity. Uh, I'm sorry about the busy slide, but this is what the complication rates are. So they divide these uh, complication rates. The grade one is basically you uh, observe the patient if you have durotomy and foot drop um, without any pharmacological or surgical intervention. Uh, there are four patients required observation. There are two. The two is uh, you might need a pharmacological intervention, means the patient has some COPD exacerbation or wound infection that requires a discovery that requires antibiotic. 
around day three A and B is basically you require in uh, intervention, surgical, either uh, either radiological, endoscopic intervention again to return to the OR. Then nine patient had a inadequate discectomy that required uh, return to the OR within the six weeks, uh, which uh, I think the cost of the surgery was uh, per surgery they calculated four thousand one hundred sixty. So hospital has to eat that. Uh, eat the cost is thirty seven thousand for thirty nine patients. Uh, grade four is a organ failure, and grade five is the death. But there was no major complications in those patients. But I think the surgeon also uh, mentioned uh, about the sequelae. So they are, although they're, well, they're basically uh, 70% of patients are the extravasation of the irrigation fluid uh, into the epidural space. Uh, um, some patient has spinal headaches, echimosis and dorsal root ganglion irritations. So there are 17% patients. So they consider that one as a, as a uh, basically inconsequential, unavoidable procedure in hurts always, uh, okay. as per the paper. So they did, did not consider that as a complication. Uh, their four percent patient has a failure to cure uh, because of the uh, inadequate decompression or like their bony anatomy, they couldn't able to decompress. So they under they underwent the open decompression. So. I think the if you so basically their total is twenty four percent complications, but Sajin um took out the seventeen percent complication out of a picture because of uh, they consider that was just the sequela of the of the procedure you're doing the new procedure that is they did not consider it as a complication. So now coming into the comparison between the um before I go to the comparison, I'm gonna mention one of the thing is about the complication is. There are so many case reports about some of the weird complications, um, but yeah, I assume there was just a one or two cases. There, one case was a cardiac arrest from the air embolism. Uh, so they're using the pressure pump to uh, that go through the uh, like saline into the wound, and then the wound the saline comes out from the wound. So one time the surgeon and the assistant forgot about the the saline bag was empty. So they are pushing the air inside the in, uh, surgical fill, and then suddenly suddenly so realize there are a lot of air bubbles in it. So they stop the pump, but by that time the patient had an air emboli and had a cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are the some of the weird complications. Where it's uh, uh, it's just probably mentioned as the case reports in the literatures, and there are multiple others too, but they are not common. And so now coming into the comparison is. So what is the is the endoscopy? This is basically clinical outcome comparison between you bipolar endoscopic techniques and then and then the micro discectomy, uh, whether you do open or minimal versus with the single level discectomy. So they enroll 141 patients, um, uh, 60 patients underwent the unilateral bipolar endoscopy, while 81 patients underwent the open lumbar micro discectomies. And uh, I think they compare the preoperative vascular for the back leg and uh, postoperative vascular ODIs. The only difference between the entire study, they, they followed all the patients for one year. The difference was improvement in the vas back pain at one week postoperatively. The bipolar endoscopy patient had a more uh, better outcome than the than the than the open uh, on laminectomy patients. So you can see it here that the the open laminectomy patient is a little bit more back pain at the one week compared to the endoscopy uh, patient. So so they they concluded as the but there was no 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 difference between the complications. Uh, pretty much operative time was a little bit higher than endoscopy surgeon. Um, blood loss is higher for the open laminectomy uh, procedure, but the clinical outcome at the three six and twelve months was comparable. There was no statistical significant difference, so they concluded as the as the the similar sufficient discectomy. The results or outcomes are same for the pain, disability, PBL, hypospadial stay, and post operative back. But they they concluded as the endoscopy uh, surgery will while preserving the spine tissue. So I think that's probably the reason why the patient has less back pain for at one week. So now the the comparison between the uh, 
bipolar endoscopy versus microscopic lumbar decompression laminectomies patient. So this is a randomized control trial. So they enrolled the patient either the patient did not know whether he's undergoing the minimal invasive versus a bipolar endoscopy uh, depression. So they included 32, 32 patients. Ultimately, at the one year, they have a follow-up for 28 patients in endoscopy spine surgery patient and 25 patients in a, in a minimal invasive decompression. So there was no difference at the ODI at the one year between two procedures for all the uh, on between the all the all the patients, so there was a primary outcome they are looking at it. There was no difference, but their secondary outcome they are looking at it. There was no difference between two groups were for the VAS score, VAS leg pain, ODI score, or any other method they are trying to look at it at three weeks, three months, six months, and twelve months. Okay. Um, they are also looking for the uh, serum CPK level just to see. Uh, which surgery do more muscle damage. So they are doing the serum CPK level 48 hours after the after the surgery. And then interestingly, uh, the serum CPK level has no difference between the, between the two groups. So there was no difference in the complication between two groups as well. So the only thing was a little bit different was for our endoscopy patient because we are going through the sailing uh, through the operative field. So that was a post-operative drainage was significantly higher in the bipolar endoscopy group compared to the William and Wesley group. So, so coming into the uh, now bipolar endoscopic decompression um, or clinical and radiological outcomes. So there was a debate about endoscopic surgery preserve the soft tissues uh, more than the minimal and uh, tube surgery. So is it probably is beneficial for the to prevent the androgenic instability in the future. So they are, in this paper, they are looking at the clinical and the radiological outcome. So they have 89 patients who underwent the um, basically urethral laminotomy with the bilateral decompression using microscope versus bipolar endoscope. So group A was uh, 35 patient was endoscopic surgery. Group A is a minimal invasive microscopic decompression, uh, 54 patients. So the clinical outcome was looked at the ODI, was scores. Magnet criteria is time to ambulation, the hospital stay, and then the, all the complication operating time. The plain radiograph, they are looking at the flexion extension views um, at exactly around at one year to see whether there is any difference from the preoperative versus postoperative um, uh, actually at the one year. So there was the only difference between outcome was the there was a, a postoperative back one back in score was lower in endoscopic spine surgery patients compared to the open decompression. So that, I mean, that's, uh, I think there was less muscle dissection uh, required for the endoscopy, that makes sense. But the but the three months, six months, and 12 months of last back pain was no statistical dip, 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 difference between two groups. Uh, there was no difference in the radiological outcome as well. So they, they, they concluded as the, there was no increase in instability from the minimum invasive decompression versus endoscopic decompression. So what is what is the future expansion? So now, uh, initially it was started with the uh, lumbar discectomy, then it went into the interlaminar uh, decompression uh, discectomy versus bilateral lumbar decompression. Now, now they started doing the endoscopic lumbar interbody fusions. So you do endoscopic decompression, you put it into body discectomy, and then you pass the percutaneous screws and rod. Um, so that's a new um, expansion. They're looking into the endoscopic resotomies for the for the chronic back pain patient with the facetogenic back pain where they are doing the medial branch block and, and then do the radiofrequency ablation for most of the time, low gross back and in a six to eight months and patient having a facetogenic back pain again. So they are looking into the uh, endoscopic rhizotomies for transatogenic back pain. Um, they are also looking for then endoscopic rhizotomy for the sacroiliac pain, SI joint pain. Um, the more expansion is recently, the, some surgeons started doing the endoscopic surgery for the epidural metastatic tumor. The major issue is, uh, uh, is the bleeding and then the uh, epidural hematoma postoperatively because the metastatic tumors are, are very vascular. So they are recommending the doing the embolization for every tumors. Um, uh, 
if we are doing it. So they are trying to expand more and more uh, on the indications. So this is what uh, what I, I I gathered the information. I think Eli uh, already mentioned about it. The 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 uh, between the uniportal and bipodal uh, endoscopic spine surgery. It's a bipodal endoscopic spine surgery. I think uh, we are so used to with the arthroscopy as orthopedic surgeon, so it becomes easier for us to use a bipodal. So most of the surgeon uh, are more comfortable uh, getting uh, more confident and um, doing it, the bipodal endoscopic surgery. Inadequate decompressions are lower in a bipodal endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, there is a steep learning curve, but you can, as long as you are uh, you can you know uh, you have extensive experience of the conventional open conventional open spine surgeries and you were trained with the minimal invasive spine surgery, then your your learning curve is a little bit less steep uh, as a surgeon. And uh, you can easily you know, avoid common mistakes as long as you pay attention to the uh, details about the bipolar incisions, how deep you're supposed to be. Um, orientation of the scope is important. Um, and then the anatomical of vascular anatomy is important so you can able to see, so you don't have to convert into the, it would be the open once you can't able to see anything. Uh, inadequate decompression and antrogenic instability. So either less, too less of a laminectomy and uh, extensive laminectomy is a real complication by the naive endoscopic spine surgery. And this been in the literature since 1970. And it's still, this day, this is still in the literature. If you're naive endoscopic spine surgery, there was inadequate decompression is is a real thing. Around there, there's some papers, most of the papers, like complication rates are really comparable to the my, minimal invasive uh, decompression and micro discectomy for lumbar cases. But they they also mention about the some of the unavoidable procedure, uh, sick is they don't consider as a as a complication. But those are the minors, minor complication, I would say. But uh, they say is a is a light, slight deviation of the postoperative course. The most of the literature concluded there was no difference in the clinical outcome between endoscopy and minimal invasive discectomy lumbar decompression for it. And uh, at 12 months, but there was one difference was uh, short-term vast back pain score was better in the endoscopy compared to minimal invasive. Uh, I think it was because of the less dissection of the muscles and it helps with the hydration and and then decrease in narcotic pain medication intake. Um, there was no uh, difference in the postoperative instability within the decompression. Either you do endoscopy or minimal invasive uh, spine surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bunzel and and uh, Dr. Patel. That was really a fantastic overview. We have uh, four minutes for questions. Feel free to just speak up or put something in the chat box or raise your virtual hand. Well, I'll, I'll channel our, uh, maybe our biggest uh, skeptic about uh, these procedures who, who is traveling today and not able to make grand rounds. Uh, Dr. Bellababa. And so, um, girl, what, what would you have done? Uh, what would you choose? What procedure if you needed a simple discectomy or a foraminotomy or, or laminotomy or laminectomy? I mean, uh, if you're looking at the long term, um, uh, outcome at three, six and 12 months, I think there was no difference. But you're looking something which is like short term and then you're looking for like I have less back pain or there's something I can try in the regime. So I think it's there. I as for I mean it's on a, it's not a litigation from my experience. I like my when I do the tube compression, I think patients are really go back to work pretty quickly within three weeks to six weeks, which is probably the same for the open micro discectomy because we don't do that, that much of muscle dissection. The only thing is like, yes, you're going to have a little bit more post pain in the initial one week, but that's the only difference I, I found in the literature. And I was actually spent like a couple hours to three hours to go through the hundred abstract sets yesterday just to find um, like, and at this point, endoscopic or spine surgery versus any minimal invasive spine surgery they do or the decompression, one or two level decompression 
and I find the paper which has a like better outcome than endoscopy on a long term, and I fail. Um, so I spend a couple of hours to go through this hundred ex- abstract, uh, and I found nothing so far. So I think the 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 issue is 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 still it's pretty naive surgery. The surgeons are pretty naive who's doing it. So once it gets more and more adapted, more and more experience, people doing it more, then you might have better outcomes with it, but and then less complication rates. Well, th- this so may, that's what I, I think. Yeah, this may be um, reflect my my ignorance of the procedure, uh, and either of you can um, answer this. But my understanding is that the data you present on operative times uh, doesn't include um, setup time. And when you include that, I've been told that adds quite a bit of OR time to the endoscopic procedures uh, compared to the open procedures. And so perhaps that isolated number that just so- shows surgical time, um, you know, incision to closure is, is not quite reflective of how long the procedures actually take. Is that is that true? I, I think that's true. Uh, and that also is the operative timing is actually double for the compared to the open because people are so used to do the open quickly while the operative time with the endoscopy is pretty much double. So the efficiency of the surgeon using the block utilization is so poor with endoscopic surgery. That's another reason why I think Eli mentioned about the about the how the reimbursements and then utilization of the block and those are the things that are harder with this endoscopic surgery when you're starting as a new. And how about with the learning curve? Does that, do those times converge or will it always take longer to do it in the same procedure endoscopically? So the, the uh, well, I went, I threw, went through the literature about the learning curve. So you, the initial 20, 30 cases are, takes a longer time. But once you get used to it, that operative time gets almost half. Like once you start at 100 minutes, go down to the 50 or 60 minutes, which is pretty comparable to the open disc. The I just talked to the, because I, I, I did the cadaver lab by photon endoscopic spine surgery with the, under the uh, Virginia Mason surgeon. His name is Phil Louis. So we did it together. He, he bought the, we both started process to find bipolar endoscopic uh, system at the Virginia Mason and the UW together. He, he, he got it pretty early. Um, but you know, we are, we are units who watching it takes time to buy everything, but he just finished 20 plus 20 cases and he, he, he texted me and this is, I mean, really steep learning curve and he's pretty good. So he, he, he mentioned that this, I had a, I took a way too longer doing this things and the inadequate decompression is is really the real thing. So when we did the kit, I would say there was one mentor was there from Michigan asking like how many uh, inadequate decompression here. And then this is what he told me. Initial 10 to 20 cases, he did the endoscopy decompression and then he cut the skin and cut it into the minimal invasive like tube, past the tube underneath just to see how much he did with the endoscopy. And it had like a little bit of a better understanding that how much he did not do it. So then he revised the decompression for initial 10 or 20 cases just through the tube. Once he finished the endoscopic that he thought like he did enough, but he found that there was not enough when he passed the tube in. So that actually makes him a little bit more understanding how much you have to do when you are an endoscope. Um, so that gives you a little bit more idea so that you can avoid those complications by doing that. Yeah. But- I don't see any other questions, so I'll I'll ask you um, one more. One of the things I was thinking about when you were presenting this is you have multiple small incisions versus one incision, for example, if you're doing a microdiscectomy, and and the fluid that you're passing, you know, into the operative area, so you can expand the soft tissues and and see what you're doing. That that's some sort of you know soft tissue dissection in and of itself, and so. I was just wondering when you put it all together, is it really less um, invasive in a sense than than doing that microdiscectomy or laminotomy, laminectomy um, through a you know small incision? Um, so when I do the tube incision, it is I usually put three centimeter large skin. Uh, that's my because your your tube is twenty two millimeters, so you need 
three centimeter when you expand the tube a little bit. Uh, so I use three centimeter skin in here and I cut the sub Q and I cut the fascia underneath the three centimeter. That's it. And then everything else is a dilator. Um, so while endoscopy bipodal, you do these portals are eight millimeters uh, for endoscope. So you put eight, milli eight millimeter incisions, like two separate, but you actually cut the fascia and then it a little bit more. So you can have like wiggle room so you can move your hands. Uh, so fascia is not like making any any um, uh, resistance to you. And then you are past the point and you are at the V. Yes, your muscle is uh, less dissected. Um, you use a little bit of shaver and then pass the fluid. Um, so I think, I mean, it's pretty comparable. I'm I'm not sure how less you can able to do a okay. with micro discectable. Okay, thanks. And and just to wrap things up, Dr. Bunzel, because you also, you, you, you gave us a fantastic introduction to the topic. Do you want to close things out and, and give us your perspective on what the future holds for endoscopic spine surgery? Yeah, happy to. I will say um, going into the presentation, I really was hoping to find evidence that supported this, what seems like kind of an inevitable trend towards uh, adoption. And it seems like, as Dr. Patel showed, a lot of the data, the really strong data shows no significant difference. It shows maybe some minor differences at earlier time points and maybe earlier return to work in theory. But um, I, I do think even though it may not be borne out by data that it is superior to previous methods, I do think that it that this is sort of a, a wave that is coming regardless of whether or not um, programs choose to adopt it. You know, just anecdotally on the interview trail, it seems like a lot of a lot of big academic programs have at least one surgeon who's doing endoscopic spine surgery. Either they've been doing it for their entire career, or they're starting their practice with that as part of it. So I, I do think that um, as time goes on, we'll have more facile surgeons doing endoscopic spine surgery who can then train the next generation. But I think that we're probably, we're probably years out from it becoming a little bit, um, a little bit more, or, uh, more widely adopted. Uh, but I do think that it's, it's, it's going to be added to the armamentarium of decompressions. Um, I think I, I have my skeptical uh, beliefs about fusions thus far, uh, but I think you know, that just shows the ambition from, uh, from programs and kind of wanting to, to push it forward. It, it, it looks like it would be very amenable to robotic surgical techniques also. And so, uh, maybe the same as for our, you know, request for, um, with UW to purchase at least one robot for, um, total joint surgery. It, it's good. You know, we're using the argument that, um, it's, one, a, a marketing tool, two, um, mm -hmm. for total joint surgery, even though you can't show any differences in clinical outcomes yet, we're all anticipating that at some point in the future, you will be able to. And three, maybe most importantly uh, of all, um, we, we can't really um, neglect the fact that we have to train our residents now to be able to use these techniques that are uh, coming down the pike. So it sounds very similar, uh, for both total joint surgery and, and, and endoscopic spine surgery. Um, doc, Dr. Lack, uh, this will, we're running quite late. So this will be the last question. Will? Oh, yeah, I, I think, I think you touched on it, Howard. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that, that was really, uh, wonderful. Appreciate the work that both of you put into this talk. Uh, thank you. And, and everybody have a great week. Okay. Don't forget, don't Thanks, forget so CME. Aaron has posted something in the chat box. So text to get your CME credit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eli.